All right, we're going to have the arrow on 39. There were seven or eight people on the island who possessed the right to give names. Auntie Muskrat was one, Day Thunder, Swan, Old Man Miguaz, and an ancient lady named Wabanikwe knew how to dream names. Mama had asked, and each of them had tried, but not one of them had yet dreamed about a name for Niwo. For some reason, said Auntie Muskrat, that dream won't come. She even slept and fasted in the woods for a name, but the spirits were stubborn. Old Wabanikwe, who dreamed many names, had no name for the baby either. But she said that she would give no other name until she found one for the boy. She searched her dreams. Meantime, baby Niwo grew. Omakias decided in secret that the naming was up to her. In play, when just the two of them were together, she gave her little brother names, bird names. Chickadee, she called him. Apichi, Robin, Little Junko. Sparrow, gross chick. He seemed to like all of his bird names, and when he heard them, he grinned and waved his chubby arms in delight. Omakias could hardly resist Niwo and played with him as often as she was allowed. There was something about the way he looked at her so sadly with big soft eyes that made her want to cuddle him tight in her arms. There was something about the way he smiled when she made a face surprised so grateful that made her kiss and touch his hair with great passion and indignation in her heart. He should have a name. And clearly he wanted out of his teak in the gun. Omakias wanted to help him to freedom. Page 40. Her chance came one morning later on in the summer. Omakias's mother, sister, grandma, and little Pinch all wanted to go into the village and see the big canoes that had arrived to unload furs at the traders. Omakias's father, Miquam, wasn't with these voyagers, but Mama hoped that they might have news of him. The thought itself made Mama so anxious that she got ready to go off in haste, though baby Niwa was still sleeping. Why don't you leave Niwa with me? Amakias asked at the last moment. I don't want to go. I can take care of him. You'll get there faster. She saw Mama's thoughts falter. You don't want to go? I don't. Angeline and Grandma were already halfway down the path. Little Pinch was tugging on Mama's legging, whining for something to eat. All right, Mama decided. We'll be right back. Now don't do anything. Just rock him, Mamakias, and play with him if he wakes up. Don't do anything. Of course not, said Omakias, trying hard not to show how excited she was to have her baby brother. Niwo, all to herself. She made herself tall and acted as grown up as possible, rocked him with one hand gently, page 41, while she waved goodbye to Mama and kept rocking long after her mother rounded the corner and disappeared with the ferny forest growth. He didn't wake. She quit rocking, just stared at his slumbering face. His lashes were so long and stiff, his little chin so chubby, she wanted to stroke it. The skin on his cheeks so fine and delicate and soft she could hardly keep from brushing her lips across them. Tufts of silken hair stood out all over his head and his breath was still sweet with milk. She touched him gently. Baby Niwo, Chickadee, the name popped into her mind. Today I'll call you Chickadee, she said. His eyes opened as though he understood. His look was bright and filled with secret jokes. He gazed up into her face. For a long time, they looked at one another. It was perfect. It was love. And then his face crumpled. One fat tear squeezed from his eye. His lower lip shook. Suddenly, his mouth flew open and he bawled. Omakias was so close, so dreamy and happy that the force of it nearly flipped her back head over heels. 
His squall was like a whirlwind, like a sudden wash of freezing spray, like a harsh wind, weather like a hot wall of sound. Shoo, shoo, shoo. Amakias rocked and muttered, shushed and hummed and sang an old lullaby her, page 42. Her mother used, nothing worked. Baby Niwo screamed louder with increasing force. Omakias was alarmed. She'd never heard him scream like this, had she? What was wrong? Was something a, a biting fly, spider, tick, bee? Something stinging or biting him inside the tight binding of his tikinagum? Only one way to find out, unbind him, and that was forbidden. Still, as Niwo's miserable and now hysterical sobbing continued and even got stronger, she decided to make a grown-up decision and take Nemo from his cradle board. And so she did. She undid the twist of vine that held him inside, the beaded velvet wrapping. She carefully untied and spread, page 43, and spread the embroidered wrapping, then took out his diaper, moss, and brushed him off like a root pulled from the ground. He was naked, of course, but it was a warm day, and so she lifted him immediately into her arms, still weeping, and brought him to a sunny place just beyond the house, behind the trees, out near the water. Omakia suddenly realized that Niwo had quieted. Her ears were still ringing with the sounds of his cries. Seagulls wailed. A skinny shorebird ran up and down the sand, busily pecking. Niwo brandished his chubby fists, blithered at the water, blasted spit excitedly at the sparkling waves, and turned his melting and mischief-filled eyes upon his sister to tell her that she was the most wonderful human on earth. She settled him beside her on the warm stretch of rock, put a stick in his hand. He looked at the stick, tested it with his gums. He had one pitiful little tooth he was very proud of, and he tried to use it to bite the stick. The stick was too strong for Niwo. He banged it purposefully at little circles of green lichen scattered on the stone surface. When the stick broke in two, he yelled in sheer joy and continued beating the rock with the short end of it. Omakias was so happy that she laughed out loud. You'll be a drummer, a singer. I'll dance for you. Page 44. She said, although it was wrong of her to have set Niwo free, it was very obvious that, that, that he had always wanted to be banging a stick on a rock and feeling the warm sun on his face. They sat together for a good while longer. Omakias tossed stones in the water, sending up splashes to surprise her little brother. And he, turn, and, in turn, and he, in turn, seemed to try and talk to her in serious burks and babbles about what it was like to be a baby packed into a carrier hanging on a branch all day long, never allowed to throw rocks or stuff leaves in his mouth. Omakias thought she heard him tell her this was the best day of his life so far. She thought she heard him tell him that she, he was, she was his favorite sister and he liked her much, much better than Angeline. He definitely said to her that he would never forget this and that when they were very old, he would stare at her the way he was doing now and laugh and they'd, be bo and they'd both be toothless then. But I have to put you back now or else I'll get in trouble, Omakias said. Regretfully, she lifted him into her arms, a delicious baby weight, and carried him jouncing back to the clearing and the house. As she laid him back into his wrapping and began to lace him in, his face crumpled in betrayal, and he opened his mouth. Quickly, Omakias reached into her pocket. The remains of the treat from Old Tallow was still, page 45, was still there. She popped the last little bit of the lump of maple sugar onto his tongue. His mouth closed. He, a look of blissful surprise came over his face. His body relaxed. By the time Omakias had him laced back into the tikinagum, 
His eyelids were drooping, and by the time her mother came home with no news of her father, but with a br bit of brilliant red cloth, four brass buttons, and six thimbles, for which she'd traded a load of dried fish, Omakast was rocking Miwa as though she'd been doing so all along, and her little brother was smiling in his sleep. The month of picking heartberries went by. Little Pinch jumped off a low branch and made a huge gash just over his eye. Blood came pouring down and he seemed both proud of himself and sorry for himself. And he selfishly hogged attention for his injury to the point where Omakias could hardly bear it. Mama was constantly preoccupied with him. Of course, that left Niwo more and more to Omakias' hands, and she didn't mind that. After the hours they'd spent in freedom, it always seemed to Omakias that she and her little brother exchanged a secret knowledge in their smiles. Grandma began to call Little Pinch by a new name, page 46. A new name, Big Pinch, because he grabbed handfuls of food and tried to stuff his face. He was, he was very slow learning manners. It was hard to teach him he had an eager, greedy, pushing nature. Omakias liked him less with every day that passed and wished desperately that someone, old Tallow or her Auntie Muskrat, perhaps, would ask Mama if they could keep him. When he got on her nerves, the worst she imagined and dreamed. Maybe someone who'd lost a son would ask for Pinch, or maybe their father, Miquam, would arrive and say he needed an always hungry little boy of five winters to accompany him on his next long trip. The missionaries, they, the missionaries, they might want to use Pinch as an example, but of what? Things not to do? He could live underneath the church, something, anything, just a little relief. He was so annoying to Amakias that she found herself occasionally wishing a dreadful wish that an eagle or old grandfather owl might snatch him up and carry him to a high nest. She always stopped herself with her heart when her heart grew dark, but oh, these wishes were satisfying. And that's where we're going to stop for today. <laughs>